All right, guys. It is a gloomy, rainy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization on this gloomy Monday morning. I think we're at February 9th, 2020. You have stumbled into Collapse Chronicles, I hate to tell you. My name is Sam Mitchell, and this is my little co-pilot Sancho Panza doing what we do every day and that is chronicling the collapse of this civilization and of this planet. Is that a cardinal or a wren singing in the background on this gloomy day? But anyway, uh, today we're going to talk about global catastrophic risk. Oh boy always a conversation worth having since so few people are having it and this is an essay from the excellent website resilience.org by a fellow named David Karowitz uh, and David is a physicist and human systems ecologist working on large-scale and catastrophic risk he is director of risk and response at the Geneva Global Initiative. And there you go. And uh, so anyway, what David is telling us today on resilience.org is that we need to talk about catastrophic global risk. Oh boy. Yes, we do. The systems which underpin our lives are increasingly brittle and face a growing array of intensifying pressures. We must prepare, although nowhere in the, in the article does he say how to prepare. But anyway, it goes without saying as his segue into the larger story he uh, talks about the coronavirus uh, and all of the the fears surrounding the coronavirus and I'm not gonna I'm sick and tired of getting myself in trouble by my stating my opinion but he wraps up his segue <clears throat> you know looking at whether coronavirus is going to bring down the uh, global industrial society with the conclusion this latter outcome is very unlikely okay thank you David for clearing that up so anyway then he moves on to the bigger picture uh, there are two elements that can be seen in the overview above you know talking about uh, this small little blip uh, on global industrial society. The first is related to the structure of our civilization, social vulnerability, and the potential for contagion and in extreme collapse. The second is that society, for broader reasons, is losing resilience to shocks, while stressors environmental and socioeconomic are growing in range and intensity. This means that societal systems may have entered a period of sustained global destabilization coupled to an increasing likelihood of catastrophic systems failure. It is no longer these, it, it is too these elements that we now turn our attention to. Okay, and now for the big story behind the coronavirus. <clears throat> we have become ever more part of a singular civilizational organism that has grown in scale, complexity, interdependence, and speed. As it has evolved, it has optimized towards growth, efficiency, and self-stabilization. People, organizations, businesses, and countries can design and influence it in parts, but the whole 
the whole is the emergent outcome of many interactions evolving over time, there is nobody in control. This was one of Terence McKenna's favorite uh, sayings. You know, back in the uh, 1990s, Terence McKenna continually pointing out there is nobody in control of global civilization. It is completely out of control. Thank you, Terence. Thank you, David, for pointing this out. There is nobody in control. It is the structural and dynamic properties that define societal stability, resilience, vulnerability, the propensity to contagion processes, global systemic destabilization, and collapse dynamics. Our ability to sustain our basic needs anywhere now depends upon system integration everywhere. That means no infrastructure, society, or country can be fully resilient as the conditions that maintain functions are dispersed beyond visibility or control. To get a sense of why complexity can amplify a societal shock, consider sophisticated surgery that requires the skills of five distinct specialists working in concert. If just one surgeon is incapacitated, the entire operation must be stopped. They can't just do 80% of the procedure. This vulnerability to the weakest link becomes more acute as businesses, critical infrastructures, and public bodies depend upon increasing numbers of specialized roles and inputs that are essential for the output of the whole. As those outputs, be they goods or services, may be necessary inputs into other businesses and services, failure can cascade even shutting organizations where everybody is available. <clears throat> Because our society depends upon multiple interacting networks within cities and across the globe, there are many routes to cascading disruption. This is an example of non-linearity. A relatively small number of directly impacted people or functions can still cause the failure of an entire system, with a capital S I put on the word system, the speed of our societal progress from just-in-time logistics to financial transactions means that shocks can rapidly cascade. <clears throat> We can think of society as an ecosystem, with keystone species providing the structural anchors through which society functions. Such keystones include critical infrastructure, read the grid, telecommunications, water and sanitation, etc., the financial system, social, so, societal cohesion, supply chains and environmental inputs, food, oil, water, etc. These are also interdependent with each other. If you remove any one of them, the others will topple. This allows us to see other paths toward systemic failure. I'm having a major deja vu, people, that I read that very paragraph recently. Am I doing a video all over again? I know that I read it anyway. Maybe I just remember read. 
Am I losing my mind? Don't answer that question, people. Anyway, a severe solar storm, natural disaster, or a major physical cyber attack on the grid provides one avenue to large-scale infrastructure failure. The President's National Infrastructure Advisory Council's 2018 report examined the United States' preparedness for a prolonged <clears throat> wide area catastrophic power outage. Again, it would undermine societal integration and lifeline operations depending on, upon the centrality of this impacted region or networks to global systems integration, it could drive global process contagion and systemic failure. Growing international tensions are therefore adding to this risk. A massive cyber attack or war between parties with high global centrality becomes everybody's problem. Even the toe is in trouble if the heart goes to war with the liver. The global financial system is also an increasing source of catastrophic risk. It is the operating system for the flow of goods and services. It is massively over indebted now. There are far more claims on future economic growth than can ever be delivered and it is losing resilience as monetary policy becomes less effective and polarization within countries and discord between them intensifies. Indeed, this is what is increasing general vulnerability to supply chain contagion from a pandemic or other catastrophic shock. It now faces the convergence of growing climate change and environment related impacts, multi-dimensional threats to food security, potential critical resource constraints, and the feedback of those stressors on socio-political socio stability and conflict. A global financial system collapse would be similar to a catastrophic pandemic collapse just an inversion of the initiating shock, a financial system supply chain cross contagion. <clears throat> Pandemic risk is also growing. It may not be the coronavirus. Mm, it may not be the coronavirus, but someday, somewhere, a virus with high infectivity and virulence will emerge with potentially catastrophic consequences for our species. Urbanization, large scale, a large scale animal food industry, intensive transportation networks, advances in widely accessible biotechnology, our increasing incursion into animal habitats, the expanding impacts of climate and environmental change, and the growing likelihood of socio-political instability are increasing the likelihood of such an emergence. So we are now, according to David, entering the age of destabilization. The, the recovery from coronavirus will be slow. In addition, there is potential for further pandemic waves. It may also contribute to the generation of new stresses and shocks later in the year. <clears throat> For example, the disruptions to agricultural production in China and elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> Australia, where we see drought influenced by climate change. 
East Africa, where we're seeing a locust plague influenced by climate change, is more likely to be further compounded by other clim climate impacts as yet unrealized. A rise in the cost of staples on global food markets is more likely to drive social unrest and even state failure in poorer countries, generating new stresses throughout global systems. This would increase stress even in rich countries with more of the population struggling to get by and feeding the effects of a slowing global economy in addition to any economic impacts of the coronavirus. It could be expected to squeeze discretionary income putting further pressure on economies and the financial system and increase social tensions. This is but one speculative path. There are innumerable potential interactions in a myriad of potential tail risks. Whatever path the global economy takes in the next year, it will bequeath an even more fragile economic and financial system that is already facing mounting risks from climate change related impacts. There are increasing risks to global food production with many drivers in addition to climate change. The multi-dimensional impacts of declining biodiversity to socio-economic stability are accelerating. The security impacts of climate change are growing, while societal polarization and loss of trust continues. Though receiving little attention and much misunderstood, there are major reasons to be concerned about the ability to sustain affordable oil production. Food oil, water, a functioning financial system, a stable environment for societal infrastructure, and large-scale societal cooperation are individually critical for the stability of global systems integration. We are now seeing intensifying stresses on all fronts. Further, stresses in each will tend to further increase pressures on the others. These stressors are intensifying their interactions through increasingly vulnerable civilizational networks. Society locked into systems of de dependency adaptive to system stability with correspondingly low resilience is vulnerable. In such an environment, economic growth is persistently undermined. There is increased socioeconomic stress while the intensity and frequency of shocks increases. This creates the conditions for rapid and diverse local and globalized contagion compounding simultaneous crises and the generation of new stresses and shocks. General systemic instability, volatility and uncertainty accelerates and future expectations become more pessimistic. These impacts are likely to become more non-linear with associated tipping points. Losing a thousand euros means different things depending on whether it's your first or last. Even more so if your rent is late, an eviction beckons, a family member is sick and needs medicine, and those who once might have supported you <coughs> be it friends or state or YouTube uh, watchers are themselves overwhelmed. 
Similar scenarios could be drawn for any scale of societal systems. As the need to build resistance into existing systems becomes more apparent, our capacity to invest in inventories, flood defenses, and critical infrastructure redundancy is more difficult as incomes fall, affordable financing becomes scarce, scarce or non-existent, existent, and the ability to produce and access con constituent inputs becomes uncertain. Further, in an increasingly stressed and volatile environment, the necessity of maintaining existing systems and expectations is more likely to take precedence over investments in future resilience. Good Lord, guys, I, uh, when I got into this, uh, I did not realize David was writing a book. I'm going to put the link on here, but I simply have to skip forward. This goes on and on and on. I'm just going to hit a few couple more paragraphs and wrap up his conclusions. Uh, society's capacity to deal with stress, shocks, and catastrophes are primarily shaped by their historical experience. Yeah, uh, so he looks at that. Uh, Our siloed approach to individual stressors means our society may be seriously underestimating global and catastrophic risk. We need to consider our transforming risk environment from an integrated perspective. The interactions of a growing range and intensity of stressors, environmental and socioeconomic, through increasingly brittle societal systems. Uh, then he breaks this down for, okay, let's get to David's conclusions. And the conclusion number one, we do not know what the future will bring. Risk is a measure of impact and likelihood. The, the impacts outlined above, and I skipped over a bunch of them, could be devastating. We have also suggested that the likelihood of destabilization and catastrophic systemic failure is growing. We are manifestly ill-prepared to deal with such consequences. We can hope, we can hope and work towards kinder futures, but we must also prepare for things going seriously wrong. Our species rarely anticipates and prepares for novel risks nor should we expect this to happen now. We need to be able to move forward with preparedness efforts without relying upon wide society buy-in. Facing such challenges head-on is an act of optimism, yes. It will, it will require the combined efforts of astute governments, citizens, social organizations, the private sector, and philanthropy. There is nothing else as important or as urgent. I hate to be a copy editor. There is nothing else so important or so urgent but I think we get the message uh, from uh, David Karowitz. And, uh, anyway, guys, if you enjoyed what David had to tell you about the future of global industrial society and where we're headed, which is over a cliff, 
please spend a few seconds to thumb up this video. If you did not enjoy what David had to tell you about where global industrial society is headed, take a few moments to downvote. And by all means, when you're over here, please subscribe to Collapse Chronicles for more doom and gloom. But with all of that said, uh, I need to wrap up today's Chronicle of the Collapse and try to figure out how to post a for sale by owner ad on Zillow.com. Wish me luck. Bye, guys.